Lanchia, the Special Task Force on Rural America. Our goal is to give rural America a seat at the table in Washington. I'm going to go back a second. The needs of families and businesses living in our rural communities are much different than those of the folks living in urban and metropolitan areas. And my father was a farmer, and my grandfather was a farmer and up in South Dakota, and then in Harvard, Illinois. Our new life was a little bit different for them than it is when they came to urban America. Unemployment is higher. Access to resources to grow a successful business is more scarce. Access to health care can be hundreds of miles in any direction. And the care of our veterans received, which is what we are here to discuss today, does not always meet their unique needs. Anyone who wears our country's uniform deserves the best care, but many of those living in rural communities lack meaningful and timely access to a lot of types of care they need. It is difficult for aging veterans to drive hundreds of miles to the nearest VA facility for care. And those who make the decision to live in a veteran's home for long-term care often move away from their local families and loved ones. It makes care much harder for them. Managing chronic disease and accessing mental and behavioral health care is challenging. And all these problems are compounded for American Indians <coughs> living in tribal communities. I and many members of the task force have introduced or supported legislation that addresses a number of these issues. But that is only a small fraction of what we get, can be done. That is why I am thankful for you that you all accepted our invitation to join us today. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to our conversation about both access to and quality of care, the future of telehealth care, what we can do for veterans who need our, and w or will need long-term care in the future, the needs of Native American veterans, and much more. I'll introduce the panel. Of, we have uh, Roscoe Butler. A Deputy Director uh, for Veterans Affairs and the Rehabilitation of the American Legion. Thank you for being here. Uh, Jer Jeremy Villanueva, uh, Associate National Legislative Director of Disabled Americans, American Veterans. Thank you for being here. Ken Wiseman, Associate Director, National Legislative Service, VFW, Washington Office. Thank you. Thank you. And Jefferson Keel, uh, President of the National Congress of American Indians. So with that, I'm going to Yes, Mr. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having the hearing and for your leadership on this. I know that this, uh, these are important issues to you. Uh, I value your, uh, your commitment to making sure we can do something about it. And thank you to the witnesses who, who came today. Uh, I'm a member of three of the organizations. <laughs> and uh, for years, I represented both the Senate district and the congressional district that had more tribes, that, not more Native American, but more tribes than any other district in the United States of America. So uh, we've got a, a connection also, and I really appreciate uh, all of you being here, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what you have to say. I just want to uh, briefly mention that um, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit disturbed right now. Um, I'm disturbed because uh, we have become very, very proficient in creating more veterans at a greater clip than we've ever done in the past. And yet, we are failing poorly uh, in regard to, maybe we're failing greatly, uh, in regard to being able to provide them with the health care that they deserve and that they earn uh, when they come home. Uh, our ability to take care of our veterans' health needs is outright shameful. And uh, it, it, it's troubling for me uh, to see year after year we pass more legislation that leads to more veterans and we do less and less uh, to take care of their earned needs uh, when they come home. So I'm interested in hearing what uh, you all say about that. And as you know, uh, access to quality health care is tough for everybody. It's always tough for veterans, and it becomes exacerbated when that veteran lives in a rural area. So thank you, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. And now for uh, Mr. Kessler. 
Well, I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for taking the leadership with uh, the Blue Dogs in this effort and uh, uh, working uh, with, together uh, with this group. I think uh, we want to raise the level of interest uh, and focus on the issues affecting our veterans, uh, especially in those rural areas. Many of us here represent rural parts of America, and uh, the challenges are always great in rural America. And, uh, this task force uh, under Congressman Allen's leadership is focusing on uh, veterans' issues in rural America. Uh, I represent uh, a large part of the San Joaquin Valley, uh, from <coughs> Stanislaus County down to Tahirian uh, Kings. One time or another, I've represented seven, eight counties, so I have a pretty good grasp of the challenges we face there. And uh, we have a, uh, a good uh, veterans hospital in Fresno. Uh, we've improved it with additional funding since the Phoenix situation, the Phoenix hospital situation, in which there were a lot of problems. Uh, Congress has come together with a bipartisan effort, as we know, to try to address those issues. We've made some progress, but there's a lot more we need to do. Clearly, I concur with Congressman Thompson in that May. Uh, we still have a, a uh, processing facility in the Oakland Center that uh, is um, just uh, a day late and hour short. I mean, uh, they've improved too, but we've had 28 months and 30 months waiting for some people's getting their disability claims processed. And uh, as you know, we've had uh, a number of meetings with the California Delegation Office over the last two years. Now, I said they made progress, yeah, they, they, they've gone from 29 months down to 15 months. Well, I guess that's progress. However, if you're that veteran, wait uh, to get your claim process. And just as an example, say, you know, that they come back and they respond and they give you a 35% disability claim. If you really believe and your doctor has indicated that your claim is really 70%. Well, you've got the appeals process, but that appeals process can take another year or longer. And you know, these many of these veterans are getting up there in years. I mean, we've had casework in my office where by the time we've got the final claim responded to and addressed and adjusted, the, the veteran has passed away. That's awful. That's shameful. So uh, this is among the issues of the Army progress, as I said, at the VA hospital in Fresno, and we have a cath lab, we have a new imaging center, and we're providing a clinic service uh, up in Merced and in Oakers with uh, telemedicine that's being employed. I was just uh, at the Merced Center last week uh, and visited with the uh, healthcare uh, uh, officials, the uh, physicians, the psychologists, and the telemedicine thing works pretty good. You can see your doctor in Fresno, even though you're set. You have real time ability to take diagnosis and have the lab work done and sent to Fresno. And for many of these veterans who are, have limited capacity for transportation, this is a big deal. Uh, but yet, you know, a lot of rural areas that don't have access to clinics like this. And so, uh, the challenge at hand this afternoon and under the leadership our good friend from Arizona, is to hear you and to tell uh, us uh, where you think the deficiencies lie. I gave a few examples, but where we can do a better job as Blue Dogs in terms of raising the visibility of the issues that you're here to tell us about. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schrader. Mr. Chairman, appreciate it. Uh, thank you guys for coming here. Uh, well, a few things Congress seems to agree on is helping our veterans uh, these days, uh, so I appreciate it. My brief tenure here uh, uh, would appear on the surface we tried to really walk our talk a little bit, uh, refunding veterans health benefits so when we shut down the government accidentally, uh, the veterans still get a job here. That's pretty sad comment about our expertise, but at least we're making sure that veterans are protected, expansion of the GI Bill stuff, get rid of some of the times you have to use it by, all these things. Hopefully, I mean, you guys have been helping us come up with a lot of these ideas. The Choice Act for Rural Veterans is critical. Uh, my district is a big rural area. There's a lot of ones here, and it's, a, it's tough for these guys to get their uh, in a time and a half. That was a big deal in the Phoenix episode. That's a the ongoing Phoenix thing is uh, from the life on some of the problems we've had. And I think we're working through that 
white veterans really like to prepare to get at the VA when they get in. Uh, we do some timelines, Portland, which is the worst in Oregon. Uh, the timelines are now starting to go back up. They were down, and they're starting to go back up. We have a tough time recruiting specialists in particular. I'm curious what you guys think about that. There's some opportunities there. Uh, we've opened a number of CBOX, you know, community based veterans. <coughs> Successful others, we struggle to keep providers there. If you guys had any insight on how we can help assure the providers stick around, they love their veterans' work, but uh, invariably, even in you know, Salem, Oregon, which I would call too rural, but we have a tough time keeping people there, to be very honest. So that's it. The chair's talking about ongoing challenge that we see in the telemedicine thing is a big deal. Hopefully, I'd be curious if the VA's Office of Rural Health is working from your standpoint. Is it making the right connections? So we using it to, to the best advantage? And what other modifications of the choice program do we need to be making? We don't want to supersede VA care. That's an alternative and a pinch. But we don't want to supersede the VA care like the uh, department and uh, really like us. So I'm looking forward to going uh, here and uh, have to be something. Thank you. And with that, we'll start out with Mr. Buck. Congressman, on behalf of the American Legion National Commander Denise H. Rowan and the two million members of the American Legion, I want to thank the task force for the invitation to participate in the Rural Health Veterans Panel discussion. In 2012, the American Legion Premier System Work Saving Program conducted an extensive three-month review on rural health. During this review, the American Legion visited 38 VA healthcare facilities and three Native American resolution. As a result of that, we produced this 2012 system work saving report on rural healthcare. From November 2011 to February 2012, the system work saving task force focused on the challenges veterans in rural areas face in receiving VA healthcare. The task force examined rural health care for several reasons. The increased number of veterans living in rural and highly rural areas across the United States, the lack of primary and specialty care providers in rural and highly rural areas, and increased time and distance in traveling to rural health care facilities. The Office of Rural Health Care estimated in 2011 that approximately 41% of all veterans, 3.4 million, live in rural and highly rural areas, with the majority living in the southern or central portions of the country. Out of the 3.4 million rural and highly rural veterans enrolled in the VA, 2.3 million were treated in 2010. According to data published in 2017, this number has increased to about 5 million veterans living in areas designated as rural by the U.S. Census Bureau. Individuals living in rural areas have traditionally been underserved because of their <coughs> lack of access to health care. This can be attributed to several factors, including lack of health insurance, little awareness of VA benefits and services, and an inadequate number of primary and specialty health care providers that work in rural communities. Previous research has found rural veterans to have lower <coughs> related quality of life scores measured by the medical outcomes uh, study short form 36 item of health survey for veterans, physical component survey and mental component survey scores, and a higher prevalence of <coughs> physical diseases comorbidities but lower rates of mental health comorbidities that under dwelling, urban dwelling veterans uh, face. Even in primary or specialty care services are available, even if primary or specialty care services are available in rural and highly rural communities, veterans have unique and distinctive health complications associated with their military services that are difficult for civilian providers to treat. Some of these war-related injuries Illnesses are traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and conditions that civilian providers are not suited to treat. The most 
noteworthy deterrents for veterans living in rural communities are the travel distances. This includes greater distance to care and a lack of public transportation that contributes to limited access to health care as compared to urban veterans. The most common theme each site the American visit visited during the site visits were extensive wait times for health care, driving distances to access VA health care, physician shortages in VHA and rural community providers. While VHA has made significant advancements in caring for veterans in rural areas, such as uh, telehealth, many of these challenges are still prevalent today. I want to address Congressman Thompson's concern uh, about increasing VA's program and improving VA services. Um, we believe that the Office of Rural Health has contributed a lot of resources in identifying what are the unique challenges veterans face in high rural areas. Uh, they've stood up a number of pilot programs to look into these uh, particular concerns. Is that enough? We really don't know, but what we can say that there needs to be more changes and advancements to ensure that our veterans in rural and highly rural areas are receiving as good or better care as veterans in urban areas. Uh, we shouldn't uh, penalize veterans because they live in highly or rural areas. We should look for better ways to ensure that they can receive the same standard and access to care as veterans living in urban areas. One of the things that we know that VA, in under its telehealth program, we were recently briefed on, is telehome, where they're bringing telemedicine into the home of veterans. That is, can be a huge game changer for veterans who live in, tele, in, in rural and highly rural areas. Uh, another advancement is teleradiology, where the imaging, uh, they have the, where VA now has the ability to read the images uh, through uh, online uh, access. That's going to be a game changer for VA in serving veterans who live in highly rural and, and, and rural areas. Things that we think are working, uh, to some of your comments, appeal modernization. Uh, that's going to be a game, cha game changer, again, in reducing the timeliness of getting these uh, appeals done. So I think VA with uh, Congress, the Veterans Service Organizations, on the right track, but there needs to be more to ensure that veterans, again, are, who live by choice in rural and highly rural areas can receive the same, same standard and access to care as our veterans who live in urban areas do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bill and Wayne. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. First, I'd like to thank you, gentlemen, for the opportunity to discuss uh, with you the issue of rural veterans, especially today being the, uh, the anniversary of uh, the Allied victory in Europe. Uh, it's to our organization, and I'm sure the, the other organizations that are sitting here, this is a very uh, you know, special day to us, and you know we thank you guys for taking the time out to listen to us. Um, as for myself, I'm very pleased to see uh, a couple of representatives from uh, California, specifically the Central Valley, being uh, a born and raised Kern County kid, uh, son of a migrant worker. Uh, we know what the issues are that are presented to rural veterans that are uh, that are out there. Um, so, the rural veterans has been a long-standing issue with the DAD. We were one of the first organizations to ask for the implementation of the Office of Rural Health, and we do have a standing resolution, thus being a resolution-based organization, that asks that there be no cuts to it, and if anything, an expansion of uh, of it could be looked at and considered. Um, now, we understand that one-third of the entire VA clientele population lives in rural areas, but more importantly than that, or not really more importantly, but more pressing an issue looking down the road, is that one-half of the post-9-11 veterans live in rural, rural areas. And with those come um, uh, a lot of the post-9-11 generation, you know, went on multiple deployments. Um, 
and we came back with the service-connected issues that come back from come with you from multiple deployments, including mental health, uh, mental health conditions that may have been um, present, you know, or obtained overseas. Now, <clears throat> when we look at the VA, we have to understand the quality of care that our veteran is, is given from it. The C, unlike in private care, uh, the VA does consider your mental health to be part of your overall health, and screenings are ever present. You don't get that in private care. Now, <clears throat> To keep up with this level of quality, uh, we need rural veterans to have greater access to, to this care, to the same quality of care as ones that uh, you know, my colleague just mentioned in the, rural, in the more urban communities. Because it should be noted that when people ever have uh, talk about issues with the VA, it's always been about access to the care and not the quality of the care. And that should be emphasized, uh, especially in today's climate. <clears throat> So how do we increase that access? Well, <clears throat> we believe that it's a um, really two real parts. One of them is utilizing technology. And of course, like you just, you just said, probably more eloquent than I, uh, utilize the technology such as telehealth, uh, the text program when it comes to eyes, where they essentially give you, uh, you show up, you get a screening, and the screening is sent to a doctor, and it comes to a full screening when it comes OCT uh, scans, which is a scan at the back, back of the eye, um, you know, uh, auto refraction, which essentially gives them a starting point to where what your uh, what your eye prescription would be, and then it's sent on to a doctor. And if there's any issues that comes up, then we'll schedule you for for that examination. Uh, we can also think of telemental health, utilizing Skype and uh, phone interviews, uh, so that 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 veteran, when he needs the mental health uh, evaluation or help. He has it there, and you can utilize whatever is in probably his own hand using his phone. Uh, they can just call and talk to somebody face to face. <coughs> and we should also uh, look at uh, something that's important to the DAV is in the Mission Act. There is a provision that allows providers to practice over state lines. Now we believe that this will utilize the resources that are already there to disperse it, especially amongst. Uh, rural veterans and that it's not just confined to say people who are in Nebraska or in Wyoming. If there's someone free in Iowa that can help someone in Nebraska, they can do so. Okay. And then the second part being uh, expanding the transportation services. Uh, the White River Junction and this is something that uh, the DAV and our IV partners or independent budget partners have looked at and said the White River Junction VA in uh, Vermont uh, should be looked at as a model for how to use uh, transportation services to bring in more rural veterans and bring them and provide them that transportation so they can have the same uh, care as the more urban urban areas. And in White River Junction, they have five vans equipped with wheelchair accessible uh, equipment, and they take up to 200 calls a day with those five vans. So it can work, and it wouldn't take much. <clears throat> and um, going on to your point, sir, is when it comes to uh, the claims process and the appeals process and more urban veterans. Um, I was talking with uh, Congressman Halloran, uh, Halloran before we went in here and gave him my own personal story, uh, which was essentially being from uh, Bakersfield, being 111 miles away from uh, the nearest you know, VA regional office. I never got my benefits taken a look at until a DAV MSO van came out there, set up in a dirt lot, and I was able to get the help that I needed. And it was the help that I direly needed and it did. It changed my life. Uh, the VSO community has been putting out that effort and reaching out and doing everything that we can to get to the more rural, you know, the more uh, rural communities to ensure that they have that access. Now, we've come a long way since then everything from you know, benefits and SCP and the tools that we be given to our, to our workers out in the field to provide that. But it could always be looked at and it could always be expanded and it could always be improved. And we're here uh, and you know, looking forward to working with you guys' offices and doing everything we can uh, to give you, you know, our point of view uh, on what we think can help out so that every veteran has that same quality of care and um, the benefits that they sacrifice and serve for. Thank you. Mr. Weisman. Thank you to Representative O'Halloran and the Blue Dog Coalition <coughs> for the invitation to speak on the needs of veterans living in rural areas. 
The VFW and its auxiliary have several concerns related to the needs of these veterans. The VFW has seen the positive efforts initiated by both Congress and VA, and we look to build on that momentum to ensure veterans receive the high quality health care they have earned and deserve. The desire to use VA and all of its services has been made clear by VFW members through the numerous surveys that we have conducted. The overall theme is to fix or keep VA and to ensure that it is made capable but held accountable. Today, the VFW will highlight four major topics where veterans are impacted by living in rural areas, and we hope to work with the caucus on improving services for veterans. First is telehealth. Telehealth technology will be the key to bridging gaps in the care that veterans receive. Technology connecting veterans to their doctor varies in capability, and funding to ensure the expansion of the number of specialties which can be provided through <coughs> telehealth will be key to this. VA estimates that technology allowing all types of appointments to occur through telehealth, what is known as a complete cart, estimated to is estimated to cost $45,000 per unit, but it includes the ability to take vitals and several other functions. Finding partners for the expansion of telehealth is key. Because of VA not having facilities in some rural areas and a shortage of broadband access also serving as a major hurdle, trusted partners will be needed to provide both locations and internet which will allow veterans to use VA equipment to access a VA provider through telehealth. The VFW, has, the VFW has partnered with VA for Project ATLAS, which stands for Advancing Telehealth Through Local Access Stations. Our first focus, excuse me, sir, how many of those are you trained to put up? Is this a pilot project? It's starting in that mechanism, yes, sir. Uh, we started in Montana and Wyoming. That vision volunteered to go first. And we're in our fundamental stage, but we are looking at VFW posts. Uh, the veteran would come in, the VFW would provide the broadband internet necessary, and they would be able to use a private room in the post uh, so that they can have their appointments. And then they would be able to, uh, we, we do see ways that this would save VA money, but also allow them to invest more into the telehealth. And also it would shorten the trip that the veteran is making to the VA. Uh, and we've, we've sent over the first round of locations in Montana and Wyoming. There's five total locations, uh, and VA is very positive to this. We are hopeful that it will both work and expand to other states. In short, the VFW is confident that telehealth will help break down barriers in ways that were unimaginable only a few years ago. As veterans move, this technology will ensure their care goes with them. The next item is recruiting and retention. The need for the best employees at VA cannot be overstated. However, recruiting and retention efforts should take into account the hardships that some providers will face when moving to an area. The needed incentives such as pay, college loan forgiveness, and other benefits should be to a level that VA is, becomes the employer of choice for all doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals. This will reduce, reduce turnover and allow veterans to have long-term relationships with their providers resulting in improved care for veterans. The next policy area is women and minorities. VA recognizes that 6% of rural veterans enrolled in services are women and 9% are minorities. The VFW is concerned that these veterans may not be receiving the care they need due to where they live. Many of these veterans live in areas where they are part of the indigenous population of our nation, such as on Native American reservations and in U.S. territories. VFW members living in American Samoa have expressed concern on the ability of their local VA clinics to address their needs. It is known that VA must fly many of these veterans and their caregivers to Honolulu, Hawaii for the care needed. That is a nearly six hour flight that only happens three days a week in part of the year and two days a week in another part of the year, and that flight is only provided by one airline. Can I get on that flight? I'm a <laughs> disabled veteran. Can I, I'm I, a spent a, client. I personally <laughs> spent a week in American Samoa, sir. We have, a, we have a VFW post in American Samoa, and I've seen firsthand uh, the relationship opportunities that are there, but also the challenges that are there. I've been there. It's an interesting part of the world. Yes, sir. They're extremely patriotic Americans there. Yeah. While these veterans report that their care being received by the VA in Honolulu is of the highest caliber, their distance to the travel is their burden. Barriers that the CHOICE program were meant to end sometimes continue due to a shortage of CHOICE approved providers. This lack is especially worrisome on Native American reservations and for women, where the distance to a VA facility is also a significant barrier to care. The VFW supports partnerships with other federal agencies, such as the Indian Health Service, to ensure that care can be provided where shortages exist. The Choice Program and Caregiver Support is our fourth topic. The VFW supports H.R. 5674, the Mission Act, and many of its components will help veterans in rural areas. 
One program this legislation addresses is the Choice Program. The Choice Program allows for veterans to seek care from community providers. Efforts to ensure proper funding and oversight, which ensures in and of itself quality care, must be the continued focal point of Congress. We are confident that the choice provisions in H.R. 5674 will strengthen the choice program. Expansion of caregiver benefits to pre-9-11 veterans is also of importance. The average caregiver is a spouse or family member, and the impact of being a caregiver is enormous. Something that cannot be forgotten is the quality of care they provide to veterans. No one cares for a veteran more than their loved one. VA has reported that money will be saved by expanding the program because of the many reasons which can all be connected to the quality of care and level of commitment shown by these caregivers. H.R. 5674 is important to rural veterans for the reasons I just stated and many others. For such, we support the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, who passed this bill today, sending it to the whole House. In addition to the fixes to choice, it will expand caregiver program benefits to pre-9-11 veterans. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak on behalf of the VFW. We appreciate the work that the caucus is doing here today. We look forward to ways that we can work in the future, and we welcome any questions you may have. Thank you for the presentation, Mr. Q. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Congressman. I, I thank you all for being here and, and for the work that you're doing on behalf of, uh, of veterans all over. As a combat veteran myself, I, I appreciate your work and, and your commitment to making sure that our veterans uh, get the services that they need. On behalf of the National Congress of American Indians, I'd like to thank all of you uh, and members of this task force for the, for the opportunity to provide testimony today. As a veteran myself, as I said, I'm proud to say that Native Americans have a long history of distinguished service uh, to this country. Uh, per capita, Native Americans have served this country uh, more um, at a higher rate in the armed forces than any other race of uh, uh, <clears throat> people, and they've served in every war, every, all the way back to the Revolutionary War of this country. In fact, um, Native Americans served this country before they were even become, become citizens of this country. Uh, my father was a World War I veteran before uh, the, the uh, Citizenship Act passed in 1923, so uh, he received a Silver Star in World War I, so I'm, I'm proud of that fact. Uh, but this, despite this esteemed service, Native American veterans have lower personal incomes, higher unemployment rates, and are more likely to lack health insurance compared to other veterans. In order to address this inequity, I'd like to share with you some recommendations on how Congress can better assist Native veterans after their service to this country. You've heard about uh, rural transportation. Many veterans, particularly Native Americans, reside in rural areas across this country. It's very difficult for them to get to uh, back and forth to uh, the clinics and, and the services that they need. Uh, you've heard the recommendations and we support that and we thank you for, for those recommendations. Uh, telehealth will be, is, is one answer. I want to talk a little bit about veterans housing. Uh, the Tribal HUD or VASH program is home, uh, addresses homelessness. There are two things that should never be used in the same sentence, veterans and homelessness. You know, it shouldn't it just shouldn't be there, but but it is. Uh, homelessness, homelessness is a concern for all veterans, especially Native veterans. And Congress created created the HUD Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing or the HUD VASH program to address this issue. Uh, it's been a, a nationwide success because of the combination of rental assistance, case management, and clinical services for at-risk and homeless veterans. Unfortunately. This program is not fully available to Native veterans living on tribal lands. Uh, NCAI and its members strongly support the, the hud VASH demonstration program, and we appreciate the work of congressional appropriators who helped set up this, this program. We now call on Congress to permanently authorize the program so that Native veterans can have the same certainty and peace of mind that are, is afforded to all other veterans uh, and that are at risk or homeless. Currently, there are House and Senate companion versions of the, of the Tribal HUD VASH Act of 2017, which would authorize expansion of the program to tribal lands. And this bill already has passed committee in the Senate, uh, Senator Tester, uh, S. Uh, 1333, and it enjoys bipartisan support. The House bill, H.R. 4359, introduced by uh, Representatives Lujan and Ruiz, 
still awaits consideration by the House Financial <coughs> Services Committee. At NCAI, we urge consideration and passage of this legislation. We also urge Congress to restore funding for the Travel Vash, uh, HUD VASH pro demonstration program to $7 million in FY, uh, FY 2019. Without sufficient funding, it will be difficult for tribes to assist Native veterans to secure housing. The Native American Veteran Direct Loan Program. Uh, this program provides direct loans to Native American veterans living on trust lands. The loans are available to purchase, construct, or improve homes to be occupied as veteran residences or to refinance a loan previously made under the program. However, the VA presently lacks adequate staff resources to conduct outreach and provide re the required level of technical assistance to deploy Native American direct loan program to qualified Native American veterans. We recommend that Congress provide authority for the VA to access a portion of the VA guarantee funding fee so the Secretary can follow the practice of other federal direct loan programs that partner with and compensate third parties to provide home buyer education, loan packaging, and other necessary technical assistance. Uh, veterans health issues. You've heard some uh, already recommendations. The VA and IHS Memorandum of Understanding uh, which passed in 2000, uh, and, well, and, and the reauthorization of the Indian Health Care Improvement Act passed in two, uh, 2010 requires the VA to reimburse the, the Indian Health Service, tribes, and, and tribal organizations for services provided to veterans. Some progress has been made uh, in ensuring eligible veterans can access efficient, adequate health services in their own communities. However, the VA's model agreement limits reimbursement to certain types of care at IHS and doesn't cover non-native veterans who would otherwise routinely receive services through IHS, such as non-native women pregnant with native children. As such, there's a continued need for congressional oversight in this area as, as the language shall be reimbursed should not permit the VA to impose limitations that weren't included in the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. Uh, veterans Treatment Courts. Uh, we're, NCAI is currently working to secure resources to enable tribal communities to establish veterans treatment courts. Uh, this is an important tool in supporting the veterans. These courts uh, focus on alternatives to, to incarceration by identifying underlying conditions such like uh, PTSD, uh, TBI that you, that you mentioned earlier uh, or you've heard earlier. Uh, and it's even more important given the impacts of the opioid epidemic in Indian country. Uh, Veterans nursing homes on tribal lands. Tribal lands are excluded from a law that provides a 65% construction reimbursement and per diem to veteran nursing care homes built on land owned by states and territories, as well as land possessed by the United States. This exclusion is likely part of the reason that there are currently no veterans nursing homes located on tribal lands, uh, and we simply need those. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, Congressman Howler for his work on this issue that his bipartisan bill HR 2716 is the nursing home care for Native American Veterans Act. This would encourage construction of veteran nursing care homes on tribal lands and would require the VA to compensate to compensate tribes for the care they provide in those homes and we thank you for that sir. Burial issues. Currently national and state veteran cemeteries allow immediate family members to receive uh, memorial headstones alongside their loved ones. However, the benefit only extends to family members who passed away after 2006 and does not extend to family members of veterans buried in tribal veterans cemeteries. Uh, there are a couple of bills that uh, were encouraged by uh, S. Uh, 2248, Senator Tester, and H.R. 3657, uh, by uh, Representative Paulton from Maine. Each have passed uh, their chambers to address the issue, and hopefully we'll see legislation enacted to extend those services. Uh, the Alaska Native veterans, uh, Alaska Native Vietnam veterans, um, approximately 2,800 Alaska Natives who were out of the country serving during the Vietnam War uh, missed an opportunity to apply for land allotment under the 1906 Native, Alaska Native Allotment Act. The Alaska delegation has introduced bills in both uh, the House and the Senate that would amend the, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act to provide equitable treatment to Alaska Native Vietnam veterans. Um, 
we, had, we urged this task force to support the passage of that legislation that would provide long overdue justice for the native Alaskan Vietnam veterans. Finally, I want to update you just uh, uh, briefly on the uh, National Native American Veterans Memorial. Uh, as you know, the memorial was, author was authorized by the Native American Veterans Memorial Establishment Act of 1994 and advanced by the Native American Veterans Memorial Act Amendments Act of 2013. At the beginning of this year, the National Museum of American Indians announced the five finalists for the design competition, and uh, we're excited that the winner is scheduled to be announced on July the 4th, and the, veteran, and the dedication of the memorial is scheduled for uh, Veterans Day 2020. Uh, this recognition... Are, are they... I'm sorry. Groundbreaking, or the we we intend we actually have it, it should be open it should be established by 2020. Mm -hmm. The construction will begin uh, shortly after the announcement uh, on July the fourth. Where's the site? It's going to be at the where the the National Museum of American Indian is now. It will be on the northeast side of it. Yes, yeah, sir. Like yes, sir. Question, yes, sir. So, yes, sir. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, I'll ask a couple of quick ones. And uh, uh, first one is, uh, Mr. Butler, you had mentioned uh, that uh, you've identified a number of issues, and that there's been some work on pilot projects. Yes, sir. Where are the, what type of issues, and where are we at on those pilot projects? Because as I've been in Washington, I've heard a lot about identification issues. But the end result has never gotten uh, very far. So uh, the number of, we cite a number of things and okay. recommendations and challenges rather in our report with recommendations. So uh, I'll make sure you get a copy of our reports. Uh, all of the uh, uh, task force members will get a copy of your report so that you can see those uh, challenges and recommendations. Um, we're continually conducting system work saving site visits. Uh, and um, I'm not I'm not quite sure how many uh, high rural rural areas we've been to this year, but like I mentioned, advancements in telemedicine, uh, advances in modern technology. Those are the things that VA has doing has been engaged in to help ensure that veterans, regardless of where they are, rural, high rural, urban areas, can have access to. Modern health care, modernized health care to overcome some of those challenges. Okay, and the, last, the other question I have is uh, to the Choice Act and the reimbursement issues. Because, especially in rural America, those reimbursement issues are extremely important. You can't find doctors, as you know, because of the reimbursement issue. Does anybody have a comment about that? Reimbursement is key, Congressman. Uh, the DFW would agree with you that the difficulties facing rural America are. are um, Amplified when you don't have that ability to have that doctor, have faith in the system that they're going to be uh, reimbursed. Faith in the system is something that's key for veterans, and it's also going to be key for those doctors who become our providers. And so, if you would like to work on that further, we'd be happy to talk more. Thank you. And Mr. Thompson. Let me just also add that part of the, in, in numerous legislation, it, it refers back to the VA uh, adhering to the Prompt Payment Act uh, to make sure that they pay their claims on time. There needs to be, uh, while they charge interest penalties uh, to VA, VA has to pay interest penalties on late payments. There needs to be more accountability to ensure that VA is meeting their timely requirements. They're supposed to be paying those claims within 30 days after uh, the bill has been issued. So there has to be greater accountability to ensure that when VA is not following a law, that it's more than just charging them interest penalties. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to make a couple of comments on the questions. Uh, one, although some people choose to live in rural areas, I, I think it's important to note that uh, people live and live. And uh, people who live in rural areas do so for a number of reasons. Uh, they came from rural areas, they back to rural areas, live on the res, whatever it may be. Um, and we just we need to recognize that those folks need access to quality health care, uh, irrespective of, of, uh, of where we live. I thank you for bringing up the telehealth uh, issues. I've, uh, I've been working on telehealth forever. I had the first bill uh, on telehealth ever signed into law when I was a state legislator that did away with 
face-to-face -face repayment requirement, that kind of broke things loose. Um, like it or not, California does lead the way, just about, uh, about everything sooner or later. Um, I, I want to just point out two issues that I, I was thinking about when, when I was listening to talk. Um, the travel issue for folks in, in rural areas. I spent 10 years getting a VA facility in Lake County, California. It was an uphill battle the whole way. By the time we got it, it we had already had a room. And it's been 20 years since that happened, so it's or probably 10, 15 years since that happened, so it's really outgrown now. The travel uh, 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 problems are, are, are still there, the facility is too small, um, and, and it, we've just flat out grown it. I have another facility in my district um, at a California veterans home in Yonville called Pathway Homes, and it's a collaboration between the federal, the state, and private donors. And it was put together to provide help for post-9-11 veterans coming back uh, with very serious problems that uh, uh, other places, other VA facilities didn't help these folks. And uh, this very unique program came together. Uh, I think they graduated 480 uh, uh, veterans who put them back on, on a path to, to re-entry to the hence the name path, pathway home. And uh, it, it was working well. Uh, about two months ago, we had a tragedy there. We had a veteran, you know the deal, who, uh, who went off the edge. Uh, he took hostages. He murdered uh, three of the staff uh, women who, who worked there uh, and then killed uh, himself. Um, the immediate response was, we'll close it down. And part of it was necessitated by the fact that he killed the staff, but it was just to shut it down. The um, problem still exists. These were veterans who couldn't get the help they needed in regular <coughs> facilities. This was a special <coughs> facility to help them out. So here we've got places that I'm, I'm sure my district's name different than anybody else's. We finally get a facility, we outgrow it. Then there's no response. We finally get a program that works, that's helping veterans, there's a tragedy, they shut it down. This goes back to what I said in my opening remarks. We're, we're, we're great at creating veterans, but we just suck at helping veterans when they when they, when they, uh, when they need uh, when they need help. So I, I have two questions. Uh, one, and you can just it can be yes or no answer to right down the line. One, uh, I believe we need not less pathway homes. We need pathway homes across the United States of America. So one, do we need more pathway homes? And my second question is, as you know, there's this big move to privatize the veterans uh, health care system. We need to privatize the VA or keep it the VA. You go right on the line. Well, starting with, with privatizing the VA, I personally, as, as a veteran myself, I, I I would not be in favor of that. I think the VA, uh, as as a, an agency, uh, could function just fine. It just needs to be, as someone says, we need to keep it. We need to fix it. You know, the the uh, in terms of of having more of these, I think there are some pilot projects that could be could be undertaken to, to put to, to establish some of these pathway homes, or, or as you're talking about these uh, highly skilled. Or you know, we have skilled nursing facilities in, in some some areas uh, that provide rehab from some of the hospitals. This could be uh, along those lines. I, I think that's a great idea. Our, the biggest problem, though, is funding those things. Is finding the money. Well, I didn't to ask. I didn't money. ask. <laughs> well, because I'll yes, go back to what I yes. said. We, we, don't, we don't have a problem getting the money to make more veterans. You're absolutely right. Sir. But when it gets time to, uh, to uh, helping those veterans with their health care issues, that's when all the discussion about the funds comes in. Yeah, absolutely right. I agree. The VFW opposes privatization vehemently. We have resolutions, we have public statements, and we've fought against those efforts here in the halls of Congress with many of you supporting our position. In terms of other facilities outside of VA, uh, when you look at community care, the, the broad net of community care, so that's care outside of the VA structures, <laughs> the buildings themselves, the VFW is okay with doing that. We believe that there's a place for it, but it has to have the oversight, you have to improve the care inside the building uh, that v is VA, and you have to be careful because too much of that outside care is that path to privatization. And, and, and just to be clear, I, I thought I explained it 
This was a uh, collaboration between the VA, Correct. the state VA, and a bunch of private companies. And so those collaborations are great. I spoke about collaborations in my testimony, and so uh, that is an option. Yes, sir. And in regards, to, I'll start you know, switching out there, everybody else. We have more to love with. Yeah. Uh, in regards to Pathway Homes, uh, we have been supportive of that. As a matter of fact, our, uh, our new commander, Delphine Metcalf Foster, uh, actually did uh, do volunteer work at that exact same facility. And we do support anything that could expand and help veterans uh, and give them that quality of care um, that they deserve. And when it comes to privatization, and like I mentioned earlier before, there is no place in the private sector that is like the VA for when it comes to veteran-centric health. And the DAV has been adamant about that. Do you have a Yeah, I have a, a question and uh, actually two questions. So, um, I referenced uh, after the Phoenix debacle, the uh, uh, legislation that came forward where we provided additional resources and uh, a change in the law. And I'm trying to remember, my colleagues might be able to help me, but where a certain care might not be provided in a facility with a 100 mile range, uh, and maybe the 100 miles is not the threshold, but you could seek uh, private sector care within your area. Uh, and I'd like to, I mean, I get a sense from talking to my veterans in my area how that has worked, but I wanted, uh, in terms of the experience that the organizations have had, how oh, uh, do you think that's still across the country? Because in rural areas, a lot of times, where again, we talked about it this afternoon extensively, that transportation is a challenge. And sometimes a VA facility is just too far away. Uh, in, 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 in the uh, valley, uh, while the VA facility I mentioned in the clinics provide a lot, uh, some good service, they really can't deal with extensive heart surgery. Uh, that's in Palo Alto. Well, I mean, the travel of Palo Alto uh, is, for people in the Valley, that's a long distance. Uh, and uh, usually when you have that kind of specialized heart surgery, you're there for a week, sometimes more than uh, uh, a week, and then for your family to be able to do <coughs> another hardship. So has this uh, provision and the, the change in the law been helpful? How that's, no, I'm sorry. Mr. Butler, quickly, what are your answers to Mr. Thompson? Uh, the American Legion has a resolution 372 which imposes closing of privatization of VA facilities. And pathway homes, if it's done under public private partnerships, the American Legion has a resolution that's supporting that. Mr. Watson. So, to your comment, uh, Congressman Costa, the uh, Choice Act is that care in the community. Right. And so it, it is good. Uh, there is success. But choice was meant to be something that brought down the backlogs and also there needs to be a fixed VA. So it can't just be all in one direction. It's got to be balanced. Choice will have its place in the community care network. But the care inside the VA is also something that has to be improved. Uh, also, for the American Legion, it works when it's patient when it's VA directed care. So when VA is directing the care out, it works because it's close coordinated care. If it's not coordinated care and the veterans go outside and, and obtain private care without being directed by the VA, then there's, it creates a lot of issues for the VA. And I would agree with my colleagues. Um, the choice was that patch, that was that, that band-aid to, to get those wait times down. Uh, we do believe that now with the new community care that's going with the integrated, uh, the bus being driven by the VA, that that's where, what, what the future is, and that's what we look forward to. Well, I, I agree with, with what's been said. I think the, the idea, though, that, that a veteran that didn't have to travel that, that long distance to get the type of care, but some of the specialized care that they need, they have no choice but to go uh, those long distances or go to a local particularly if they have a health, uh, heart attack, for instance. Um, and I think that's where the reimbursement comes, the, the mechanism kicks in for the VA and, and the private. One final question, yes. uh, and you touched upon it, and whether we're talking about Native American veterans or veterans who are disabled, uh, veterans who have served our nation with honor and distinction. One of the great tragedies, and I think all similarly, is the homelessness and uh, in California, we estimate, and I have 
I'm smoking off a little bit, every evening there's between 16 and 18,000 victims in California that are part of homelessness. That's just a tragedy. Anyway, uh, shape or form. In 2000, I was part of the effort in the state legislature to create a bond measure that would provide $200 million to provide ex extended veterans' homes because we had one in, in, in uh, Mount Villas, as uh, Mike Johnson says, we're going to one in Marshall. The voters passed the bond measure. We have built five new ones, one in my district in Fresno, 300 units. It's full. But it's still not enough, uh, clearly. The VASH program that you noted uh, has provided some support and staff stop gap. But uh, I try to impress whether we're talking about veterans or other uh, of the homeless. I mean, this is an epidemic around the country. And uh, for these veterans and for the others, uh, the homelessness for 99% of them, I believe, is, is, is not by choice. It's not that they want to be on campus. Uh, when you, it is simply a reflection of underlying factors that have caused the homelessness. And until you address those factors, uh, whether it be mental health issues, whether it be post-traumatic stress syndrome, and of course with veterans, that's a big one. And then you add to that uh, substance abuse of one kind or another, and name the drug du jour, whether it's opiates or whether it's alcohol or whether it's other uh, drug abuse. And it's usually a combination of all of the above. And until you have the sort of mental health programs available, and in Fresno Veterans Hospital, we have a post-traumatic stress syndrome for unit that is uh, working. But again, uh, these, these individuals who have served our nation with distinction uh, find themselves <coughs> in the deals. Uh, they uh, have host of issues, and unless we're able to provide the services to treat all these issues, we can never build enough stopgap housing to deal with them. And, and the housing is just shelter, frankly. Uh, it doesn't deal with the underlying problems of the homelessness. And so you, you can get more shelter, again, until you deal with the underlying causes. And, you know, I think it's something we have to gather on the organizations, the Blue Dogs, and others to provide the resources in that effort. In closing, uh, thank you. In closing, I just want to say that, uh, you know, people, Mike mentioned a little bit ago, people don't live in rural areas just because they want to live there, actually. They provide water, the natural resources, maintenance on our highways, <coughs> the pipelines, you name it, the food that America eats. These are why people live in rural America. And we have to find out how to give them a better quality of life to make sure our veterans are cared for appropriately. We, when we talk about distances here, we talk about, you mentioned about six hour club train club. Care for them. I have people that go five hours by car one way and have to come back that night. Yep. <coughs> I talked to a veteran the other day that said, sometimes they leave on the bus at six in the morning and don't get back till midnight from uh, my district down in Phoenix and back for one visit. These are the type of issues. And we, when we talk about choice, choice is, a, choice is about also having provider care that's needed in a timely fashion. And throughout rural America, whether you're a veteran or not, you're not getting that. And so these are the real issues that we have to start to discuss. And you guys aren't going to get off the seats that easy. <laughs> We're going to call you on some, for some homework. Uh, we're going to ask you to uh, your prepared text. We'd like to get those. But more importantly, we're going to use you on a continual basis. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.